الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما صدق الله العظيم فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was once sitting with his companions and a man passed by and he said to his companions, what do you say about this man? And they responded that this man comes from a noble lineage. If he is to propose to someone, his proposal will be accepted. If he is to speak, people listen. If he is to do intercession on someone's behalf, then it will always be accepted. The Prophet ﷺ remained silent. Few moments after, another man passed by. And he asked his companions, what do you say about this man? And they responded in the exact opposite. They said, if this man is to propose, it will always be rejected. If he is to speak, people brush him off. He has nothing important to say. They don't listen. And if he is to intercede on someone's behalf, it will never be accepted. Then the Prophet wasallam he said to his companions that this man is better than an earth filled with the former. So the lesson from this story is that what we as society define as success, what we define as a winner, is not what Allah and His Messenger have defined as a winner. And we as slaves of Allah have to make it a duty upon ourselves that our ambitions, our goals are aligned with what Allah wants from us. That we become chasers of Allah and not the chasers of the dunya. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, Inna Allah la yanzuru that Allah does not look at your bodies. He does not look at whether you are short or tall, whether you are beautiful or not. He doesn't look at what your ethnicity is, whether you are black or white, Pakistani or Indian, Egyptian, Somalian, Libyan. Allah does not look at this. And He continues, وَلَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ suwarikum. And Allah is not interested in your appearances, what people think about you, what car you drive, what house you have. This is of no importance to Allah. But rather Allah looks at your hearts. He looks at the content of your hearts. And on the day of judgment, there will be powerful kings that had everything that they, had, that they wanted in the world and their weight in the eyes of Allah will be less than that of the wing of a mosquito. 
it will be less than the wing of a mosquito. And the Prophet says, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى عَنْ كَثْرَةِ الْعَرَضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى النَّفْسِ That richness is not in an abundance of possessions. It is not in an abundance of wealth. But rather, true richness is in contentment. It's in contentment. And how many thousands of people are there that have all that they desire they have the nicest houses they have servants taking care of their needs they have servants making food for them they have assistants taking care of their chores they have the nicest most comfortable beds but are unable to sleep at night they don't have any contentment and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that if the son of Adam is given a valley of gold, then he will only desire another valley of gold. Nothing will satiate the stomach or nothing will fill the, the mouth of the son of Adam except the dust from his own grave. Except the dust from his own grave. And in the early 1900s, we had the richest man in modern history, John Rockefeller. His net worth was four times that of Bill Gates in current times. And a reporter asked this man, the reporter said, how much is enough? How much money is enough money? And John Rockefeller responded, a little more. A little more. In other words, recognizing for himself and for other people, that no matter how much the human being is given, they will always desire more. Have you not seen the one who takes as his Lord his desires? And one of our scholars said that desires makes slaves out of kings. And contentment makes kings out of slaves. Subhanallah. But in this culture that we live in, this culture that is obsessed with consumerism, addicted to shopping, we are oftentimes focusing more on what we lack than what we have. When we walk into the supermarket or when we open the computer and we surf the internet, we are constantly being bombarded with advertisements that are reinforcing the idea that we are not complete, that we need more, that we can be happier, that we're missing out on something. And these advertisements, and by the way, in 1970s, there was research done on how many advertisements the average American sees. And they found that the average American sees about 300 to 500 advertisements per day. They did this same study in 2006, and they found that the average American is exposed to 3,000 advertisements per day. Now in 2018, they, they did the study in, at the end of 2017 again, and they found that the average American is exposed to 10,000 advertisements per day with the advent of social media. And these advertisements, they are engineered by marketing experts, by psychologists, by sociologists, who's, who, who have dedicated their lives to studying human psychology. They have dedicated their lives to identifying human weakness so that they could control our subconscious thoughts. So don't be fooled. Don't be manipulated by these people's objective. They have an agenda. And one of the other side effects that emerges out of this culture is that we become ungrateful. Grat ingratitude is embedded into our hearts. We begin to complain about every little thing, every little problem. And it reaches a point where we begin to complain about our blessings. And Allah destroyed nations 
because they denied their blessings. We ask Allah for protection. Now, when we look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we study his life, we find that the difficulties that he endured were much more than anything that we have went through. The tribulations that he had were the most that any other, any human being has been through. Because Allah elevates people through difficulties. He elevates people through tests. And we know the prophets, they had the greatest of tests. And out of the prophets, the Prophet ﷺ was the greatest. So, we know the Prophet ﷺ, he is born without a father. He comes into this world without a father. And when he's about five or six years old, he is coming back on a journey with his mother. And he witnesses his mother passing away right in front of his eyes. What pain would a young five, six-year-old boy feel? Witnessing their mother passing in front of their eyes. The helplessness, the vulnerability. And we know the pain that he felt because 50, 60 years later, the Prophet and the companions, they were coming back from an expedition and the Prophet told his companions that we're going to take a detour. And he went to the place where his mother was buried. And the companions, they described this moment as a very emotional and vulnerable moment for the Prophet He sat down next to the grave of his mother with his arms around his knees. And he, he was shaking and crying because of the pain that he felt when he was five, six years old. And that carried through with him throughout his life. So his mother passes away. And now he is in the care of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And he also passes away before the age of 10. Now, we have to see the divine wisdom in this. Allah is preparing the Prophet ﷺ for the mission that he is to undertake. He is preparing him for the mission of spreading the truth to humanity because it's not going to be easy. So now we fast forward to when the revelation comes upon the Prophet in the cave of Hira. And he's frightened, he's stressed, he doesn't know what's going on. So he runs down to his beloved wife, his most beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha. And he says, Zamiluni, Zamiluni, cover me. And she gives him support, she gives him kind words. And then she accepts Islam. She becomes the first convert to Islam. Now the Prophet ﷺ spreads it to his close people. And he is given the commandment to spread it to the public. And the Quraysh, they torture his followers. They oppress and and manipulate the followers. And at this time, everything is going downhill, but the one thing is that Abu Talib is protecting the Prophet ﷺ because he is an aristocrat. Abu Talib is, he's the head of the tribe. So he protects him. But everything keeps getting worse until Amul Hazan, which is the worst year of the Prophet ﷺ, the year of sadness. And in this year, his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, his backbone, she passes away. His internal support, when he comes home after a difficult day, the one who gives him emotional support is now gone. And a few weeks later, Abu Talib passes away. His external support, the one who socially and politically supports the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is now not there. And this opens the door for the Quraysh to harm the Prophet even more. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in this year of Amul Hazan, the worst, the lowest point was, you know, a few years after Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked him later on, 
Was there anything worse for you than Uhud? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, Yes, Ta'if was the worst day of my life. And the lowest point in this period is when he goes to spread the message to the people of Ta'if. He goes to the leaders, the three leaders, and he tells them about Islam. And they manipulate, they, they mock him, they make, a mock, they make a complete mockery out of him. One of them says to the Prophet ﷺ, Could not God find a better Prophet than you? Could not God find a better Prophet than you? Na'udhu Billah. And then he goes to the people and he tells them about Islam. And the leaders, they tell the slaves and the kids to take stones and pelt the Prophet ﷺ, to the point that he begins to bleed, his foot becomes attached to his sandal. These were the difficulties that he endured so that we can be Muslim, so that Islam can spread from the west to the east. And now we see the fruits of, of, his difficult, of the difficulties that he went through. And our beloved Prophet وسلم, lost five of his own children. The grief, the pain that he must have felt. None of us have been through things like this. But one quality, one amazing characteristic of the Prophet وسلم, is that you do not find him once complaining about the difficulties he's going through. And this is a huge issue that we as a Muslim community face, that we victimize ourselves. Everything is being done upon us. We're, we become reactionary rather than proactive. The Prophet was a man of izzah. He did not victimize himself. He did not pull the victim card. Look what the Quraysh are doing to me. He didn't do any of that. He was a man of izzah. He was a grateful servant of Allah. And Ata, one of the Salaf, he went to, he went to Aisha radiallahu anha after the Prophet had passed away. And he said to her, what is the most marvelous thing that you saw from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And she responded in a beautiful manner. She said, what about the Prophet was not marvelous? What about him was not amazing? And she went on to say, that one time I was laying down in my bed and the Prophet, he laid down right next to me to the point that his skin was touching my skin. And he said to me, leave me to the worship of my Lord. Leave me to the worship of my Lord. And she responded, Wallahi, inni uhibbu qurbaka. Wallahi, inni uhibbu qurbaka, ya Rasulullah. I love to be close to you. But I prefer what you want. And so the Prophet ﷺ got up, he made his wudu, and he began his tahajjud prayers. And he stood such a length of time that his feet became swollen. And when he recited the Quran, tears flowed down from his eyes, that his beard became wet. His chest became wet. And he continued on and on until Bilal radiallahu an called the adhan for fajr. And Aisha radiallahu anha approaches the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Ma tabki ya Rasulullah. Why are you crying? When Allah has forgiven your past sins and He has forgiven your future sins. In other words, You've made it. You're the messenger of Allah. You're going to be at the highest level of Jannah. You, you, all your sins are forgiven. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shall I not be a grateful servant? Shall I not be a grateful servant? Because he was worshipping Allah out of love. You know, there's three roads that you can take. The first one is that you worship Allah out of the fear of punishment. And number two is that you worship Allah out of hope of reward to get Jannah. 
And number three is that you worship Allah purely out of love. And this was the way of the messenger. And it's like when a mother, she has three sons. The first son does the chores so that he doesn't get punished. So that he doesn't get a timeout or get his Xbox or video games taken away. And number two, the second son does it so that he can get some reward. So that his mother can praise him or get him some gift. And the third one does it not out of fear or hope of reward, but does it out of pure love. And this is the best road to take. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who worship Allah out of love. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائل المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أشرف الخلق وسيد الأنبياء والمرسلين ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. I request everyone to move forward so that the brothers in the back can find space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ That if you are grateful, then we will increase you in your blessings. And if you are ungrateful, and the word that's used is kufr, which means ungrateful, and the extreme form of it, is to reject God himself. Reject God altogether. So kufr, it means ungrateful. Inna adhabi la shadid. If you are ungrateful, then Allah's punishment is terrible indeed. And he says, wa in ta'uddu ni'matallahi la tuhsuha. If you were to enumerate the blessings of Allah, you would not be able to. And the word that's used is ni'mah which is a singular form of blessings. So in other words, if you were to enumerate the blessings that Allah has given you within one blessing, you would not be able to. Inna Allah la ghafoorur rahim. Allah is forgiving and He is merciful. And He says in the Quran, وَلَقَدَ آتَيْنَا لُقُمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرُ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرُ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ Luqman alayhi salam said, be grateful to Allah. The one who is grateful does so for himself. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ And the one who is ungrateful, Allah is the most rich, He's the richest, and He is the most deserving of praise. So when we are grateful, it benefits us. And it does not add to Allah's richness. It does not add to Allah's greatness. Allah is the greatest without our prayers or with our prayers. But it helps us. And if you go check out some of the self-help books in, in, the, in the bookstores, Barnes & Nobles or Amazon, you will find that these self-help books, one of the central themes is gratitude. But this, our deen has already given us this. And if we follow the deen, then it will improve the quality of our lives. UC Davis, they did a study that, uh, where, where they had people who were suffering from depression and they had them over a long period of time write down the blessings that they have. Write down what they are grateful for. And over the period of time, the depression was uplifted. But this is the effect that gratitude has and the power that it has. And a beautiful story that illustrates the value of the blessings that we have on a day-to-day -day basis is the story of the scholar and the king. There was a king 
who had such a large kingdom that no other person has had. He, everything he wanted, he would get it right away. And a scholar approached his king and he said to him, how much is your kingdom worth to you? And the king responded that this kingdom, there is no value that I could put on it, no monetary value. It is worth more than anything. And the scholar said to the king, if you were stranded on a desert and you had no water and you were at the brink of death, how much would you give for a cup of water? And the king said, I would give my kingdom. And then the scholar said, if you were in a position, if you had to relieve yourself and there was a blockage placed that you could not relieve yourself, what would you give to have that blockage removed? And the king said that I would give my entire kingdom. So in other words, a cup of water and a trip to the restroom is worth more than a kingdom. I once asked a young boy, seven, eight years old, how much is this pinky worth? How much is this pinky worth? $10,000? $100,000? A million? And he responded, not even a million. He said that there is no amount of money I would take to give away this pinky. So a seven-year-old is able to recognize the value of just a pinky. And this is a relatively insignificant part of our body compared to the rest of our parts such as our brain, the complexity that's been put into our brain, our hands, the ability to speak, the ability to see. Allah has given us two of the most amazing cameras ever created. Our heart, the fact that it pumps on its own, we don't have to ask it to pump. All of these blessings we have to be continuously grateful for. And we often forget to say Alhamdulillah for these because they are so normal. The normality of these blessings has dulled us. We forget to be grateful about the beautiful weather, about the sun, about the fact that we have parents. How many children don't have parents? About the fact that we have children. How many people don't have children and are unable to have children? And students, have to be thankful for their education. How many people would do anything to be in your position, to have the education that you have? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us grateful human beings and allow us to align our will with Allah's will. Because when we are content with what Allah has destined for us, then Allah becomes content with us. And this was the status of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een. Inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi. Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام 